Hello, podcast fans, and welcome back to a very special new episode of of the Hit or Miss Star Trek podcast. Uh, It's an interview that we're going to be doing. You will have seen we've done some on our Star Trek channel before. Uh, We are going to be interviewing somewhat of a geek legend, uh, Patricia Tolman. Uh, Patricia is perhaps best known for her work in the 1990 cult classic Night of the Living Dead as Barbara, the beleaguered heroine. Some may argue she's best known for her role as Lita Alexander in... uh, the award-winning series Babylon 5. Either way, she's been swept into a career that features horror and sci-fi projects. She's less recognizable, but no less memorable, as the horror hag in uh, Army of Darkness, the third Evil Dead film. Uh, Theater being a true love, Pat was delighted to be featured in the Los Angeles Sci-Fest of plays. Uh, Fans make a game of spotting her in the over 50 appearances in the Star Trek franchise across Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and the feature film Generations. Zombie fans will enjoy Dead Air, and sci-fi fans may enjoy Pat's book Pleasure Thresholds, Patricia Tolman's Babylon 5 memoirs, which is currently in its second printing. Her recent work is helping people release their inner badass by leading epic quests to live their dreams of adventure and creativity in Patricia Tolman's magical living, uh, which I'm sure she'll tell us all about. Uh, Pat's other projects include starring in the sci-fi audio thriller series Anne Manx, playing the evil badass Lieutenant Jean Richmond. Her favourite role is that of mother to her son, Julian. Equally important to Patricia is her fundraising activities for the children of Penny Lane. Through her efforts when the sci-fi and, with the sci-fi and horror community, Pat and her fans have contributed more than $350,000 over the past several years. Uh, since 1996, Pat, her friends, family and fans have made a holiday happen for the Penny Lane kids through the Be a Santa program. Uh, you can go to beasanta.org to join in the fun. We will, of course, link that in the description. Uh, and fans can connect with Pat on her blog, which is at questretreats.com, uh, on her Facebook page, facebook.com slash Patricia Tallman page, capital P, T and P, uh, at Quest Retreats for Nerds or at Patricia Tallman dot rocks on Instagram or on Twitter at Patricia Tallman. Uh, all the links are in her Koji page, which we will again link in the description to this video. So, yeah, very excited to be talking to Patricia. We're both huge fans of uh, her film work and her work on our favorite nerd franchises, Star Trek and uh, Babylon 5 and the like. So, yeah. yeah. Um, DK, uh, anything you're particularly looking forward to asking her about? Uh her movie work. I love Night of the Living Dead. Uh, B5, mm. if we can manage to fit in. But yeah, yeah, and pretty yeah. much anything. She's, she's bringing everything. Absolutely. I'm going to hope she maybe chats with us a little bit about Star Trek being a Trekkie nerd. But uh, obviously, Jurassic Park for me, if, if we can get her to talk a little yeah. bit about, uh, about experience on that film, it means a little bit of importance to me. So yeah, without further ado, we're going to cross over to ourselves and uh, we'll be hopefully here chatting with Patricia Tolman. Okay, so... Uh, We'll dive right in. You uh, you began at a, a very early age, appearing with your father on his radio show. Is that right? Mm, that's very true. Is that what inspired you to become an actor? No, I didn't. I, I was two years old, so oh. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, kids are so what, what's the word uninhibited. You know, there's no filter with children, which is what the that which is why they're so fun. I don't remember it at all, but um, yeah, maybe that maybe there was something in there that it was. Oh yeah, this is uh, this is what I'm gonna do. I have no idea. Isn't that amazing though? I mean, you think about that as kids. I love the idea of of when you think about what you really really loved when you were tiny, and you had no inhibitions, and you just were just loving whatever it was, fully yeah. all out. When you think about that later in life, it's usually still something you enjoy, even in your 60s or your 70s. You know, you still you still love those things, whether it was, yeah. you know, creating a thing or, yeah. So maybe maybe I was, you know, always to be a, a performer. I have no idea. Inspired. You just knew that you loved it at the time. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I did. <laughs> uh, that's cool <laughs> well um, a lot of your early acting career i noticed was in uh, musicals and musical theater uh is that a genre that you're especially drawn to and do you have a favorite musical if so <laughs> oh wow yeah i was really drawn to it i love dancing and 
I was never an amazing singer, but I could sing. I could hold a tune. Um, I could learn a part. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I, I did Bye Bye Birdie. I was the lead in that. Um, I, it, yeah, there was some amazing times in musical theater. I ended up working uh, off Broadway in musical theater. I did a lot of shows in high school and college. I started working professionally when I was 15. So all through all through my career, I just I was always somehow involved in a musical theater program, and I always loved it. There's something about telling stories with the heightened reality, whether it's whether it's stage combat and a or or science fiction or fantasy like Lord of the Rings or even musical theater. Honestly, that it's all related in that it's a heightened reality using different elements to give a different experience so that humans get to be transported out of the mundane and the, the regular and you go off into these into these fantasy worlds which are really just a hyper extension of our own so it's a, yeah it's a really interesting way to tell stories awesome fantastic um, and uh, do you recall <laughs> what it was that led you into stunt work was it just that that was the only way into these sort of heightened genres <laughs> Right. No, no. Um, I, I always enjoyed sword fighting. So for me, the, it was um, it was using it was first of all, it was action adventure. Do, doing anything that was hyper adventurous was attractive to me. And then the the romance of period sword technique just to me i loved it i always loved it i watched basil rathbone as a, errol flynn when i was a kid you know i loved those oh, wow. black and white movies and you know going to yeah i mean it was uh, i just always really loved it the sword fighting thing and there was also you know the bad guy like basil rathbone was always the bad guy and he <laughs> seemed to be having so much fun <laughs> <laughs> being so evil and so good with weapons you know, just, uh, I, so i started taking in new york city because i'm a huge nerd i would take dance classes and period sword technique classes because i just loved it and i met Brilliant. people in those classes who were stunt people and that's when i first became aware of stunts as being an actual career I had no idea. I mean, back then in the 80s and the 90s, we didn't, who knew about stunts? We really didn't pay attention yeah. to it then. Not as an actual job. You know, it might yeah. be a fun fact behind the scenes or something, yeah. but you yeah. never really thought about it. And then, you know, so for me in 1980, let's see, so 1980, I did Night Riders and I met a bunch of stunt people, but they were doing things that I wouldn't do, like motorcycle riding. That I had no interest in, and then, but then the the uh, the sword work I was interested in before I even got to college. Cool. So yeah, so I would say that would be my gateway drug. It was a, a weaponry, <laughs> edged <laughs> weapons in particular, that got me interested into stunts. That's fair enough. It's a uh, note to the audience out there: never <laughs> mess with Pat Talman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I was just yeah. going to say, um, Basil Rathbone might be sort of the, the evil villain to you guys. He'll always be Sherlock Holmes to us here in the UK. <laughs> it, he was an amazing Sherlock Holmes. He was like yeah. my favorite. I, although I love Jeremy Brett too. He was amazing yes. too, wasn't he? Oh, yes. Oh, God. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. So good. So good. Um, I am a huge Holmesian, by the way. Oh, oh wow. yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we could we could be here all day. But that's fair enough. <laughs> we could be here um, yeah, all well, day. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> enough. Yeah. Um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about it a little bit later. But um, your newest workshop at time of recording is all about conquering what you call our our fear dragon. Um, and as a an actress right. and especially as a stunt performer, uh, you must have had situations where that fear dragon came up. Uh, do you recall anything in particular that was a, a key moment? And how did you conquer it at the time? Oh, interesting question. Yeah, the the I call it the fear dragon. It's really the amygdala and and mm. how it affects our body. You know, I didn't know any of that back in when I was working as a stunt woman. Yeah, I would just push through it as we all do, you know. Uh, but it takes a toll if you don't really understand how to work with it. 
it takes a toll on you after a while. And especially if you're in a profession that requires you to face your fears on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or yeah. you're just stressed out all the time. There's a reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, stress and, and fear are, are, are best buddies. You know, they're completely related. So they're all the same mechanism in there. Now, um, so learning how to cope with it was, became really important to me. Let's, but I liked your question. So let's see. Anything having to do with heights, as far as mm. um, big fear for me, that I hated heights. I didn't, I never felt like I could be in control in heights. My body didn't didn't wasn't playing nice i couldn't i couldn't step go on a step ladder without feeling you know queasy and not in, in, like i can't quite balance something terrible is going to happen i have no idea why that is but it you know we all have different things that we don't that we have uncontrollable yeah, awesome. fear around right? and that heights was that for me and what it, wouldn't you know that most of my work as a stunt woman would involve some kind of fucking heights. I always had to, I always had to, <laughs> <laughs> you know, do you mind standing on the edge of this building or we're going to have you fall off this cliff into some water or, you know, it's just one thing after another. Are you kidding me? It's like Indiana Jones. Snakes. Doesn't have to be snakes, you know. <laughs> I'm not afraid of snakes, but I am afraid of ice. So, but I ended up doing it all the time. And the worst one, I think, was um, when I was doubling Gina Davis on a movie called Long Kiss Goodnight. And I talk about feeling helpless. I was on the end of a cable hanging over the side of a rock quarry where we shot all these scenes, which they would later paint in the visuals, I think it was supposed to be near Niagara Falls, uh, but it was just a, a rock quarry. And I was hanging by uh, it, wearing a harness with the cable running through my wardrobe. I'm hanging upside down in the middle of the night off of a construction crane, one of those huge construction <sighs> cranes that was perched on the edge of the rock quarry and I'm hanging, so I was probably, you know, 70 or 80 feet over the quarry floor and uh, completely helpless because if anything goes wrong, what am I going to do? You know, I, there's <laughs> nothing I can do. And, you know, on action, they just, they, they let you drop, you free fall for a while. And, and then, then the mechanism kicks in and, you know, it's supposed to slow you down. So that you don't then really smash into the ground, which is nice. So you know, I'm fingers crossed. You know, it, it, it was just horrendous. Oh, wow. horrendous! That probably took years off of my life. But, uh, yeah. So that, yeah, I would say those are the worst those <laughs> for me personally. Uh, I share your fear of heights. Yeah. So yeah, I can completely understand mm. where you're coming from with that. Uh, you mentioned you it earlier. You don't feel like you have any control, right? I mean, you don't have no any problem. control. It's it's like your body, your body's just going, yeah, no, uh-uh, nah, -uh. yeah, we're not doing this. And you're like, come on, come on, I'm on an escalator. I know I'm safe. Everyone else is just fine. Look at the little kids. Come on, and your body's like, nope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mine stretches. Mine stretches. The roller coaster. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you yeah. mentioned it earlier. Uh, Night Riders. I understand George Romero contacted you himself for the role. Is that right? And how did that come about? Night Riders. Night Riders. No, he not for that. Um, Night of Living Dead. Um, Tom Savini contacted me directly for Night Riders. Um, I had been in school uh, at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, which was George's alma alma mater. He went to Carnegie Mellon as well, CMU. And um, we were, you know, in the drama department and everybody knew about George Romero because he was a hometown boy, huge director at the time. And um, I, we, I just heard through the grapevine that he was doing this, this movie. I actually was already in New York City and I auditioned for the film in New York, even though we went back to Pittsburgh to shoot it. It's yeah. Funny that way. But you're right. I mean, Tom Savini 
did contact me directly for for Barbara in Night of the Living Dead. Um, but they they already had hired a casting director in New York, and uh, I was living. I had moved to Los Angeles at that point, so I again had to re. I had to audition and send in a tape. In those days, it was a VHS tape, you know, like this big. Yeah, and Marty Schiff, my friend who's also in Night Riders, shot shot, uh, shot it on this huge camera, you know, back in those days. Oh my God, I don't even know how I picked it up. But yeah, so I had to, I had to audition for it even though Tom was like, oh, I want Patty Tomlin. So luckily Tom was, more powerful than the casting director. <laughs> that kind of brings me to the next question, really. Uh, you took your role as Barbara in Savini's remake of Night of the Living Dead. It's always been a personal favourite. I, I think it's quite an underrated movie. Uh, Romero original, it's considered a horror classic with uh, Judith O'Day's depiction of Barbara Iconic. Had you seen the original before you took the role? And if so, were you nervous of the footsteps? Luckily, yeah, I saw the, I saw the original um, while I was in school in Pittsburgh. It was like a rite of passage. Everyone had to see it at the midnight showing in downtown Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh. And um, it was, you know, horrifying. I don't like horror movies. And um, that one is gut wrenching. As you know, the original 1968 black mm. and white. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, it's uh, intense. And when tom first said hey do you want to do you know he contacted me in 1989 i guess we did we shot it in 1990 um do you want to do this and i said no <laughs> why would i i know i don't want to do that <laughs> and, and he said and, you know there was nothing in me that that would have been able to do what judy o'day did so 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 well which was um the original Barbara, you know, you go into talk about fear dragon. You go into the four Fs when you're when you're afraid when you're frightened when you're afraid. The fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And she went into f freeze, which was just catatonic, and mm -hmm. and then dies. You know, and at that completely realistic. It was it was absolutely true and realistic, and also really true to form for that period in time when women weren't expected or even allowed, you know, to have any inch of badassery in them. So when when Tommy was, well, do you want to, we're going to do a color remake, do you want to do it? I was like, no, mm -mm. <laughs> I don't want to perpetuate that. And and it was already done perfectly. No, I don't want to do with it. And he said, no, 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 read the script. And so then I read it and I saw how he had revamped Barbara and how it was completely different. And then yeah. I was, oh, okay, okay, got it. Yeah, now that, that makes more sense for me and who I am. And in the 1990s at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you've, you've preempted my next question, actually, which uh, was regards to Barbara, because she was a, a bit of an ass kicker in your version. So I'm just wondering if that's what drew you to the script. Yeah, absolutely. I love the stories where you've got a regular person, man or woman, doesn't, whatever, it doesn't matter, regular person, extraordinary circumstance comes in and they have to rise to the occasion or perish you know that's kind of you just yeah. have to they become the hero and they don't want to be but they have to be at in order to get through to the other side or there's something that they, really inspires them as far as justice goes you know something like that but for barbara it was just a matter of uh, you, you know she had it in her somewhere never had to have it activated before but then gets to do that. So that really interested me. That yeah. was super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. This one. So how many times a day do you hear they're coming to get you, Barbara? <laughs> 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 uh, I, I don't hear it every day. Thank God. I, would <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I do I do get it uh, fairly often though when I'm when I'm out at horror conventions or you know mm. doing something like this and it's it's and i but i don't mind you know i don't mind at all i think it's really an honor to have been a part of something that people loved so much 
Yeah. 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 I think it's, it's, um, cool. it's, it's strange you say that you're not really um, that big of a fan of horror because you've worked with some real horror legends. Um, and I, I would just like to know, as an actual kind of horror nerd myself, what it's like working with Ramiro <laughs> Savini and even Wes Craven. <laughs> um, they're all, I mean, everybody. And uh, I met, I've met Stephen King and um, mm, wow. uh, Sam Raimi, for example. You know, uh, yeah, of course, all yeah. of them, really great people also. Maybe they just purge their demons and, and their creativity <laughs> and then they can be nice people. I have no idea. It's so funny too, because George is George and Stephen King both are really big people, tall, big, imposing, you know, uh, dark hair, sometimes has a beard, you know, they could be scary people, but they're so nice. Both George and Stephen yeah. were so nice to me. And uh, George was one of the most um i think beloved of all the directors i've worked with as far as his crew and the actors who work with him they just were totally devoted to him because he was so kind and empowering and he was able to be very clear and say what he wants no that's not you know what i think it's a little without ever pushing his weight around you know what I yeah. mean? He just, he always made you feel like you really did have a say in what's going on. And um, so I, I constantly say that um, I was so lucky in Night Riders um, to have George as my first director because I was fresh out of drama school and hadn't worked in front of a camera before. I'd only done theater work. Yeah. So to, to have him be my first director, I was just so blessed because he was incredibly kind. And I didn't know I was putting my ideas out there for my character. I wouldn't do that for anybody else. I knew better than that. But I would definitely have ideas for my own character. And he pretty much embraced all of them, except for I did ask not to do the nude scene. <laughs> so why do I have okay. to have my shirt? You know, he's like, no, you got to do that. And I was like, okay, all right. <laughs> but everything Fair else, he, you know, my, the ending scene in Night Riders, that was all my idea for my character. Um, oh, wow. uh, I, I'm the, I came up with the line, hey, haven't you taken some vows or something that, that Julie Dean says to Friar Tuck? I mean, there was it was really he was just really collaborative. And I, I know he made everybody feel amazing work for them so Savini's like that too he's very much a director uh he's very much an actor's director probably because he's an amazing actor himself and yeah, he yeah. he hires people he can trust he says it makes his life so much easier and I can see why that would be true he just said I know I can trust you just you, you I know that you're gonna do what I ask you to do or you're gonna you know what the scene needs I want to see what you've got you know I mean he was the same way and maybe that's because he was so close to George and it started his whole career with George. So that rubbed yeah. off on him, but he must have had that in him somewhere anyway. Um, um, yeah, yeah. And Sam Raimi, very soft spoken, <laughs> very, very kind of shy, really. I mean, he didn't, and until he wanted to direct that he turned into somebody else and would get on the, he, he was talking to us in Army of Darkness. And uh, I was in the army when uh, I was one of the stunt people. Um, and he gets on this megaphone, you know, and he starts, he, all right, all you deadites, you scum, you filth of the earth. And just, like, he's like, who is this guy? Yeah, I mean, he's, very, he's so shy. But now when he, now when he's got something to say. <laughs> that's awesome that's fair enough yeah um great well to, um, speaking of sort of working with legendary directors um I, I did read that you worked as a stunt double for laura dern on one of my favorite movies jurassic park um so what was it like on a steven spielberg set and did you realize you were working on what would become probably the definitive blockbuster of our generation wow no we certainly did not know we were making what jurassic park turned into i mean it was we, those effects had never been seen before, right? Remember, mm. you know, we, we yeah. none of that had ever been seen before. Like, we, you know, we thought, okay, you know, we've got dinosaurs. <laughs> okay, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't know they were going to be so badass, but you did know if it was a Spielberg film, it had it had a chance to be yeah. pretty spectacular. 
Um, so I work mostly with Jeff Goldblum and Laura, um, my scenes that I'm doubling Laura, um, the action. I didn't get to work with Sam Neill, which I, or, uh, too bad. Anyway, um, and Spielberg, it was a, it was an absolute thrill because he would, he would direct from behind the camera again, not a megaphone. Well, maybe it was a megaphone and he would say, okay, Pat. And then he'd yell one, two, three. And those meant, those were my marks that I was to hit during the action. For example, um, we had a, a scene where the T-Rex is chasing the Jeep and we crash through a branch, which takes off the windshield. We all had to duck at the right moment. And then we, uh, the T-Rex catches up with the Jeep, hits the Jeep with the side of its head and we escape, right? So yeah. somehow, <laughs> thank God they had those short little arms. He could have just grabbed us and we <laughs> <laughs> It was really good that they had short little arms. So for us, the T-Rex was a stick that's like, I don't know what, 15 feet tall. And it's metered off every, every couple, like two feet, maybe every 24 inches, black, white, black, white, black, white, it's painted black and white all the way up. And at the very top of the stick is a round cardboard circle that is stapled to the top of the stick. And someone had taken a Sharpie and made a happy face with teeth. That was our T-Rex. <laughs> I mean, really, we had no idea what was going to happen, how this was going to look. So, terrifying. Spielberg, yeah, it was very terrifying. Whatever. I'm more afraid of just driving through this branch right at this moment. That, yeah. that he, he, Spielberg said, okay, Pat, so when I say one, you're looking over your right shoulder behind you at this level. And they put the stick with the happy face and teeth and where that, okay, now my eye line is going to be at that. And number two, when I yell two, your eye line is here, which is much more alarming. Now it's lower and way closer, right? So it's maybe nine feet off the ground, something like that. So it's starting to run and level out. And then three is it's the, the side of the door has a, a reverse explosive mechanism in it where it's pulling the door in to look like the T-Rex has hit it with its head, but I have to move my legs because yeah. it's actually going to crunch into where my legs are. So I got to move my legs. At the same time, another explosive is going off in our Jeep that's taking a piece of um, uh, uh, an electrical pole. You know, those big round logs that you, the electrical pole, telephone poles. Yeah. So it's like a, a four foot section of that's been cut off inserted into a cannon in the middle of our jeep and on three it's going to explode down into the ground which is going to rock our jeep up at the same time this is getting smashed in so our the stunt guy who's the driver is is uh he's focused on keeping us from tipping over and i'm focused on not getting crushed <laughs> So, and then and, uh, Danny Epper, who's doubling Jeff Goldblum, is just focusing on not falling out. So that's right. <laughs> He's wow. just going like this all over the place. And, but the thrill was when, we, when they say action, so Spielberg's in the camera car that's riding off of our front right bumper. So he's in front of us right off the front right bumper and there we're all we're supposed to be tooling along at the same speed so the camera is always the same distance and then and then we crash through crash through the branch the windshield wipe windshield goes and then Spielberg goes okay Pat one and so I'm I'm looking and then he says two and then three and that was you know I got directed by Steven Spielberg <laughs> that was yeah. and I didn't die Awesome. Oh, oh, awesome. Yeah. The second time, the second time that uh, my biggest stunt was um, in the rotunda when the, at the very end, when the T-Rex and the Raptors crash, crash into the, 
the building into the rotunda area. And our heroes are climbing down from the ceiling on this really rickety scaffolding. Remember the heights thing again? Yeah. <laughs> the heights. I'm at the top of this building and I have to climb down. And they purposely made the scaffolding go like this, you know, so it's swaying back and forth. And of course, I, I have to go the furthest. The kids go, the kids stop pretty quickly. Um, R.A. Rondell, who is doubling um, Sam, he, he gets to stop, but no, Laura is the, our heroine. She has to climb, go all the way out across, uh, over the top of these di a dinosaur spine, all the way on to its neck, and then falls, holds on to its neck, and then all the whole thing falls apart and she hits the ground. But that was so hard to do, not only because it was yeah. um, that uh, so far off the ground, it really made me nervous, but I also, mm. I had to balance on dinosaur bones and they made, they <laughs> made a full scale replica of this brontosaurus um, with the bones out of resin. I don't, I don't even want to know what that alone cost, you know, how they did that. And then it's suspended with wires that go out. So, so it's this big display, right? Just like in a museum, a full size brontosaurus. I have to run along the spine of that thing, but not, I can't run just straight along the spine. No, they've got wires suspending it from the ceiling, of course. So I have to constantly stop and get around the wire without falling off or breaking my ankle because it's getting stuck in the vertebrae of this dinosaur. <laughs> and I have to accomplish it in a certain time frame too. I gotta get all the way over there. And then I have to fall on my tummy and then I have to flop around. It's But the night before when we had practiced this, we rehearsed it over and over again. And I'm wearing pads and we're all wearing long sleeves and padding underneath because we're getting dinged up. I got so badly bruised on those resin, hard, thin, you know, sort of really impacting my flesh, these bones that when I got home that night and I took off my sweatpants, I had bruises that looked like I'd bro been broke, every bone had been broken in my body. Oh, it was God. so bad. And I did everything I could. I iced myself down. I was like, I, I went to the set an hour early it was all my call was already like five in the morning i went at four in the morning when the crew was getting there and i said i don't want to alarm you i walked into the i, I couldn't believe the special effects guys were already there i went in there and i said i don't want to alarm you but you guys are going to need to get a body paint artist in here and i dropped my pants and they were like holy shit <laughs> i was solid black bruises so they did they called in a makeup artist and i just I, they sprayed me down and it, amazing, but I was really swollen from these bruises. And I also had tweaked my wrist. It was a really hard job. And it's so funny. So I finally, you know, I didn't sleep all night. I was so worried. I get there, they spray me down. By the time we're actually on the set, it's like, I don't know, nine or 10 in the morning. And um, Spielberg arrives and he calls, he, I'm talking to my stunt coordinator who's saying like, are you okay? And I was actually in a bit of tears going, I'm not okay. I'm not a hundred percent. I don't know how I'm gonna do this. And Spielberg arrives, so we both go, you know, put the nice face on, oh, we got this. And he says to, he says to Gary, okay, Gary Himes was our stunt coordinator. I had this idea last night, I had this idea. And Gary's already twitching because Spielberg's like this. He, he's, he just has amazing ideas, but he brings them in at the last minute. And it's impossible <laughs> to change these massive stunts. They've taken months to plan and build, you know, to build out the mechanisms that are gonna make this all work. And so he comes, he goes, I, I got this idea. I wanna do this shot. So we're over Pat and she's on the bones. And just like at Home Alone, you know, when we follow, the, the bad guys through and they break through them. We follow them all the way to the ground. Can we do that with Pat? <laughs> Onto a marble floor, mind you, a marble floor. <laughs> I'm like 15 feet in the air, supposed to drop flat on my back. Onto a marble floor. And Gary's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And he's twitching. He's like, yeah, we can, we can do that. Yeah. We will kill her. But we, we can do that. And he to his credit, like, oh, no, no, no. I mean, I, I don't want to kill her. <laughs> And I'm sitting, I'm right here, guys. I'm right here. Right here. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty <laughs> effects guys came in and took pictures of my bruises for reference. They said we've oh, never wow. seen anything like this on a live body. So this oh, is my word. the inside of my arms, my thigh. Like, oh, it was bad. It was bad. Yeah. <laughs> you, for your heart. <laughs> yeah. You uh, you then obviously you, you then went on to work on things like multiple episodes of Star Trek. You had the prominent role of Lita yeah. on B5 uh, during the right. 90s. What was it like on the sets of both Star Trek and B5 at that at that time? Yeah, I, I had such a unique perspective because I was uh, working on Babylon 5 at the same time as we were working on Next Generation and then Deep Space Nine. And um, I don't I don't think anybody else I know ever did that, go back and forth. I mean, there would be days I would be in, on Babylon 5 as Leo Alexander, and the next day I'd be doubling Terry Farrell on Deep Space Nine or Nana Visitor. And I never talked about it because I didn't want any producers on either show because it was a competitive situation. Yeah. I didn't want anyone to give me any shit and tell me I couldn't work because I never yeah. turned down a job. I would, I, didn't, yeah. I would work all day, all night. It didn't matter to me. And yeah, so I, I, I was very quiet about it at the time. But um, so Paramount, being over at Paramount is cool. I mean, I've been on Next Generation for years and years and years. I had a membership at the gym on the Paramount lot. You know, I knew all the security guards. <laughs> it was a very comfortable situation for me there. And then uh, on Babylon 5, we were like the little engine that could, you know, we were this little bastard stepchild of Warner Brothers that nobody wanted to give any money to. So we were working out of a, a soundstage that they had built out of old warehouses in Sun Valley, which was an armpit of, you know, of the whole Los Angeles area. It's nasty up there in Sun Valley. <laughs> nobody else wanted to be there. Real estate's really cheap. So we ended up in the Let's see, was it? The, it was an old hot tub plant or something like that at one time. So it was just a big soundstage they put that, that they created out of um, out of a warehouse that was falling down. And um, but it was, you know, we were all in it together, kind of thing. Yeah. And the producers yeah. were right there in in the same building. You know, uh, we, we, everybody ate together. We ate in the parking lot for fuck's sake. We had no, yeah, even in the rain, <laughs> we had like, you know, a tent set up. That was our, that was it, catering, you know. Um, the, the dressing rooms for the actors were all the same. Bruce didn't have a really nice trailer and everyone else have a, you know, random trailer. Nope, we all had the same trailers. <laughs> <laughs> and you, share, you shared it. It was, so you go to Paramount and it's this big corporate machine and well overseen too i mean every every little piece of star trek has gone over for quality control for as long and making sure it fits in with the you know the vibe fits in with the universe there was a lot of tension because of that on some of the shows like voyager had a really rough start uh, and that was a very tense set Next Generation was more friendly because they'd been together for a while. Hmm. Um, and then, then Deep Space Nine was, had, I think, had the nicest vibe because the people were so sweet. They were overworked, though. For the first couple of years, they were overworked. In fact, um, crew members were so exhausted. One of them died on the way home in an accident because he fell asleep at the wheel. And oh, the, the Screen Actors Guild... And the other unions changed the rules. They said, you can't work people 18 hours. You can't, you can't do that. You, they changed the rules on how hard people could, how long you could work a crew member. SAG already had those rules, Screen Actors Guild, but they started enforcing them and saying, you can't have these turnarounds constantly. You can do that once or twice a week, but you can't do that every day. You know, people were just falling over with exhaustion. But because uh, they had a lot to live, over, live up to. Plus the suits... Um, there was only one producer I saw on a more regular basis over there. The rest of them only showed up when there was a problem. <laughs> they didn't want to see, me, you know. Yeah. So it was very different, a very different vibe entirely. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but yeah I, I enjoyed both. I had a great time on both. Oh, great. I mean, since then, you, you wrote your book, uh, Pleasure Thresholds. 
uh, how in, uh, right. how enjoyable was that experience? And do you have any particularly fond memories of the people you worked with at the time or since for that for that book? Hey, the book was a, um, a great thing to do. I didn't want to do it, um, but I'm so glad I did because it gave me a chance. When I was working those days, I was working so hard. Plus, I had a toddler, a baby, myself. I was a single mom. So to, it, I, I never stopped. I didn't stop long enough to really take in the process of what, what, I, get, what I got to do. When I wrote the book, I got to go back through all my call sheets and all those memories and think about, oh, my God, look at all the things I did. Look at all the things that happened. That was amazing. So the book was a joy on that to do on that front. I also had an amazing editor, Jason Davis, who also wrote a great book on the X-Files, if anyone's a, uh, a fan of the X-Files. X -Files. Um, it, it, so I, it was a really good experience and it made me some money, which has been so helpful. Really, really grateful for that. Yeah. And as far as my cast grows, we're still really close. We're the, the Babylon five actors are all really good friends. So we're, I mean, you know, 30 years in, we're still really good friends. Mm -hmm. It's, very, it's, yeah. it's it's nice to be able to see that as a, as a B5 fan to look back and see that you're all still friends so far after. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Right. We stay, we stay in touch with each other and, and uh, try to see each other. Like when Peter does get out to the West Coast, we all get together and have dinner or something like that. We make sure that we, we make a connection, make an effort to connect. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Um, Jill, <laughs> you mentioned already you've, you've worked obviously on the Babylon 5, but also on Star Trek in the 90s. And as part of that, um, in terms of mm -hmm. acting and stunt work, you did a lot of work in prosthetic makeup, um, some of which you've not yeah. been overly uh, overly kind about the sort of the, the deny in the <laughs> outcast in particular or the villain in Starship Mine. Um, and I was just curious, <laughs> what's your favourite and least favourite, if you have a favourite, of the sort of alien makeups that you had to wear? Oh, my God. So they have different aspects, you know, um, with Kiros in Starship Mine, I just thought I looked like Bozo with a vagina on my face. I mean, seriously. <laughs> I read that somewhere, yeah. <laughs> I, you look at it. No, you look at any close pictures and then you just look. There's, a, there's vulva and clit right on my forehead. It's obvious. And they made, they teased my hair out like Bozo the Clown. I was so bummed. Like I finally get a character from beginning to end. I don't die till the end, you know? Yeah. And they did yeah. that to me. I was that, that annoyed the shit out of me. But I had, a, let's see, I, I had one, I hated the wig on and that was for, that was for Deep Space Nine. I think it was Melora. The wow. episode was called Melora. I doubled the actress playing Melora. She was lovely. And I, I had a good time, but the wig was so intense. The, the the hairline, the pins they put into my head and that wig was killing me. That was yeah. migraine city. Um, the Klingon sisters, when I doubled Bator in Star Trek Generations, the film, that was a lot. <clears throat> it's not only was it, you know, the teeth and the, the forehead, <laughs> but it was the uh, skin, the skin makeup was was pretty intense. And then of course the wig on that that was that's another one that was a lot the costume we had were was um uh made of leather so it didn't give at all it was super confining um i found out i was pregnant while i was shooting that <laughs> and wow. of course when you're pregnant your body changes a little bit while you're pregnant mm. And from the costume fitting to by the time we finished, I think I was like five and a half months pregnant. And there's some significant body changes that happen at that point. Yeah. <laughs> I was pretty, pretty miserable. <laughs> uh, but I didn't get to, I, I did get to double gates. I love that doubling gates in that in that um, British Navy uniform, which was my yeah. favorite costume I think ever was that British Navy oh, uniform. Awesome. That was so awesome. Oh, so good. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, so I think the witch in Army of Darkness was the worst makeup ever. So that right. was by far. <laughs> <the worst. laughs> so not a Star Trek one then. <laughs> Fair 
Trek. No, it wasn't a Star Trek one. No, no, no. she was. A uh, your son, <laughs> your son Julian's made an appearance alongside you in the 2009 short Waiting. Has he shown any inclination to follow in the acting footsteps of his mother? No, but he's a musician. So he does have his own, what's the word? He has his own showmanship, you know, qualities. Going yeah. He's a musician. He's a drummer, uh, a sound engineer, and and he can sing, you know, so it's really up to him what he wants to do. He plays several instruments. So, no, he's not an actor, but he does love, yeah. It is performing. performing. Yeah. Oh, nice one. <laughs> um, you, do, uh, you do a lot of work for the, the Penny Lane charity, specifically the, the Be A Santa campaign. Yeah. Um, how, how did you yeah. become involved in that? And, and why, why does it mean so much to you personally? Um, I started working with Penny Lane in the 90s. And they had a they had a uh, um, a yearly event that went on, and Dennis Madelone, who was our stunt coordinator on Star Trek, mm -hmm. would do a demonstration for the kids. So I started becoming familiar with them because I think I did that with them for like you know three or four years in a row. So I was really I loved Penny Lane. I loved the idea. They work with Penny Lane works with the foster care system, getting the kids that are most hard to cope with because they've been so abused over the, either from their original families or through the process of being in the programs. It, and um, so they, Penny Lane's pretty groundbreaking in the, what they, with the systems they put into place to help these really hard to help kids. Um, I was so in awe of what they were doing and on a shoestring budget, right? Because so we were doing this, this event, but they weren't, the event didn't raise any money for the kids. And I thought, oh, well, we could do better than that. So I started the Be a Santa thing. I didn't, I, the Be a Santa was supposed that, I didn't know what else to call it. It was, that was not the name I wanted, but the name just stuck. I couldn't think of anything better. So it's called Be a Santa. <laughs> But basically what I was trying to do is to to wrangle the sci-fi fan in community and horror fan to pitch in a few bucks and, and make a holiday happen for these kids, the, especially the teenagers, because they're really, it's like everybody wants to adopt the kitten and the puppy, but nobody wants to adopt the, the older yeah. animals. <laughs> That's a terrible analogy, but you know what I mean? Like babies when yeah. they're cute. And then you get a teenager and you're like, oh, fuck, no, I don't want to take that on, right? Nobody wants a teenager. <laughs> you don't even want your own teenagers, much less somebody else's teenager. So I thought we really need to show these kids that there's hope, that there's good people out there, that, that people yeah. do give a shit. And that's we've been doing it for almost 30 years now. Yeah, that's how I started doing that. Nice it's been the fans. It's been the like you know, fans like yourself from all over the world, and everybody chips in a few bucks. And uh, we start usually by October, and we just—it's a small program because it doesn't need to be a big program, and it's just us. And usually there's like 120 people in the end who actually donate and make a whole holiday happen for these kids. And they have—it has had impact. It is a good thing. It does make kids feel like oh. You know, I, I, and we, and we make sure every kid gets a note with their name on it and all of it. So they really feel seen and appreciated, which is, which is the whole point. Little kids get the little kids in, <clears throat> pardon me, the foster care system has money for them. And we free up funds for them too, by taking care of the teenagers, we free, they don't have to worry about the teens and they can focus the money on the little kids. So it all works yeah. out. It works out really, really yeah. well. Yeah. Is the Thanks campaign just the campaign that. run all year round, or is it just around Christmas? Yeah, time? you can donate anytime. You can donate anytime. But I don't really, um, I don't really do much until um, the holidays because that's when people are ready to donate. I find. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, some of well, my I'm regular donors do do something like on Facebook for their birthday. They'll raise money for Penny Lane or something like that. But most of the time, we just we just really focus at the end of the year. Yeah, because I was saying we can always put the link 
in the <laughs> description on the podcast so Thank people you. can donate if they, okay. if they want to. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. I was going to say, since then, you've gone on to found uh, Quest Retreats and Magical Living. We touched on it earlier. I've been a supporter of both projects for a while. I was actually gutted that I missed out on the Tolkien Middle Earth Quest Retreat. But for our audience, could you tell us a little about it and what you've got coming up with uh, with regards to that? Thank you. Yeah. I So um, when when... Speaking of, you know, all that, how fear can be pretty crushing and what I've learned about fear, uh, which is why I'm doing this, the, what I'm doing right now. Um, coming up, I have a, a webinar called How to Tame Your Fear Dragon. And um, the reason is because about 12 years ago, <clears throat> I had a nervous breakdown or maybe you'd call it a psychotic break. Or then now I call it an awakening. So what happened was, you know, just the stress and the pressure over time. Finally, it it just just like that they call it the straw on the camel's back. Just the yeah. one little thing happened, and I just completely bottomed out. I fall, fell apart. I fell apart so thoroughly though that it was quite interesting. It really got my attention this time. Instead of just pushing through fear, I really had to restructure, rebuild because I I really was so decimated just emotionally by the by all the stuff i didn't look at over the decades mm -hmm. so that i had to look at the stuff and what it really came down to for me was that i didn't understand the connection between fear and let's see and 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 stress and anxiety the toll that it takes and how you can completely avoid that if you just know a few basic things yeah it's not hard to understand if you really but they don't teach this stuff in school really now maybe more more now but the the idea that um that fear is actually your friend fear is trying to tell you something and you can work with fear if you know what's going on because the body is going through a thing you, you, I love, I love affirmations and mantras and all those things. They're great, but if you're not dealing with the body's reaction, it's not going to work. No matter how many times you say something positive, it will not do what you want it to do if you're not working with your physiology. So the yeah. connection between the physiology and the psychology is so important. Uh, I have had some pushback on this from um, people will say, "Well, you just got to change your thought." You just have to look at things differently. Absolutely. But if you're not dealing with the amygdala and what's going on in your body, it's not going to have the effect you hope it is. So mm -hmm. that's what I teach in these webinars. And that um, I started with, I started teaching different classes on how to, um, how to, build better habits into the life you want. Because what I see in our community is nerds. You know, we, we, we are so, um, we love these films and television shows, right? We love Star Trek. We love Star Wars. We love Lord of the Rings. These movies and these things, these speak to us on a really particular level. I think it's part of it is because this is how we're wired and how we learn and also what keeps us inspired. But I decided I didn't want to just read about this shit anymore. I want to live it. I want to mm. have a life that makes me feel like that. I want to have that adventure. I want to feel that engaged with life. I want to, I want to feel that wonderful. And I haven't been able to feel because I've been pushing through so much fear and so protected. And I think a lot of us have that protective mechanism. I, I don't know about you, but I was made fun of a lot when I was a kid. I had red hair. I, you know, I was a nerd and you know, got yeah. shoved in lockers. You know, <laughs> it's not an easy life being and growing up a nerd, at least back no. in the day. Now it's, you know, we're all kind of embracing that. But so I, I also think that the other really important thing is when you're trying to focus your life into to having the types of success you want in your life, whether it's in a relationship or whether it's in your job or whether it's in just, you know, um, uh, living where you want to live or taking trips you want to take, 
you need you need to have some support around that when you're alone with it and working towards anything all by yourself your brain is going to mess with you because your brain doesn't want you doing anything new nothing new even if it means i need to lose weight or my diabetes is going to get me well your brain doesn't want you to change any habits so how are you going to work with that so that you can actually get healthier when your yeah. actual brain is working against you. So we don't, we just think we're lazy or we're bad or we have bad habits and we think it's us. It's not, it's our physiology and that you can work with if you know the little tricks on that. But we're not taught that shit. I don't know why. So I teach it and I've created a community that supports each other in that process called the magical living community. Cause it's not that, that I, I think these magical thoughts, you know, <laughs> it's not that I'm waving one, but it, it, it feels magical when you actually are able to do this shit, things all of a sudden start lining up. We're so used to things being hard and th having to work hard, having to suffer, having to try a thing and just feel like a failure. We're so used to that, that when that starts to go away, when you actually just work with what's going on in your body, that it feels magical. You realize things just kind of start to flow in and you're like, how is this even possible? So then you need to recalibrate again because it's like, I don't deserve this. How is this happening? I'm not dying or working really hard. It's just kind of, you have to start to recalibrate like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is normal and you do deserve it and it does work. Yeah. It's really an interesting process. But I find that just teaching one class, like I used to teach just a class at a time or whatever, but it's not enough time to, to create those new habits. It's not enough time to really start to trust your process because you're going to run into these, you're going to run into closed doors, right? You're going to have that fear dragon show up in new ways. I, I call them faces of fear. You know, did you see Game of Thrones? Yeah. 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 So, you know, the, the faceless men, the assassins, the faceless men. Yeah. Who could put on any face and be anybody, anytime. Fear is that clever. Fear can look like hard work, busyness. It can look like perfectionism. It can look like um, practicality. And really what it is, is fear. But unless you know that and you know how to work with it, you think, oh, my God, I'm just lazy. I just need to be, I just need to do he got all these weird thoughts going on. So I wanted people to have a place to bring this in, to come in and say, I'm trying to do this thing and this keeps happening. What do I do? And then we can work together. Everybody works together. Yeah. So that's what's called magical living. Yeah. So that's it. Awesome. Fantastic. And have you got anything, <laughs> have you got any webinars coming up at the moment then? Or I, I, by the I time do. this goes, I think this is going to be on the 12th. Is that right, Mike? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. that where you're going? Yeah. 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 But then I'll have a, a replay going out and I'll give you links so you guys can post it. Um, Great, yeah. I'll have a replay for the, for how to tame your fear dragon. And then we'll be pushing into, I've got a 50% discount for joining the community. So folks okay. might be interested in that at that time too. Definitely. I'll, um, uh, I'll and then as far as the, the, I appreciate it so much. And then the, the, the trips you were asking about, I do those, I try to do a trip like once a year um, we just finished with Africa. We did a big one in Africa and they're, they're adventure retreats, um, for folks like us who want to do something really extraordinary, but it takes a lot for me to plan one. Uh, yeah. As you know, that 19, 2019 was, um, the Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. trip. That yeah. was amazing. Uh, and I'll let you know when the next one, I'm not sure I'm looking into a couple things right now to see what I want to do. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Cool. I mean, um, yeah. I'm, I'm conscious that we're we're kind of running over a bit, but we've we've had that many yeah. questions and we've had to leave that many out because there's just so. So you're welcome back anytime if you oh, want to come yeah. back. Oh, thank you. But uh, also, I'll, I'll yeah. let Mike if, if Mike's got what any last questions. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was just good. well, I was just wanted to say thank you again for chatting to us. Honestly, it's been a joy. You, you've been just a pleasure to listen to, and I could talk for hours and yeah. I could go, for, go for another hour <laughs> just you. talking about Star Trek personally. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll not keep you any longer. Um, so <laughs> uh, just one last question was obviously you've had probably the most interesting and varied career. Um, of anybody we're going to ever talk to uh, over the years. And uh, what's next for you? Is there anything coming up? Oh, I don't know. I mean, we're um, uh, in 
last year in April, I sold my house. I got married to my college sweetheart here and um, we've just hit the road. So we've been traveling and right now we're in South Africa. Next time I talk to you, I don't know where I'll be. And we're just kind of living wherever we go until we don't want to do that anymore. I don't know. I don't really know where I want to settle. I needed to get yeah. out of the United States and just like, mm. yeah, have a different experience. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm doing now. I, I, I'm looking forward to, to filling you in on, on what's mm -hmm. next. Next time we talk, we'll see what's going on. Awesome. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, yeah, I look forward to speaking to you again sometime, hopefully then. And uh, yeah. yeah, we'll let you go now because as I say, we've kept you for way longer than we should have probably. But uh, thank you so <laughs> That's much again. All right. Thank Please you for giving us your time. It's been an absolute My pleasure. pleasure. Okay. okay. Take care, guys. Take care. You too. <laughs> Bye. Bye. And there you have it, fellow uh, nerds. I'm, I hope you're as glad as we were to find out that Pat's just as big a nerd as, as we are. So uh, there were so many questions that we couldn't ask, but we were pressed for time. So, But hopefully, you know, if the, if the stars align, Pat will be back with us. She seemed quite eager. Uh, hopefully she's enjoyed it. So, again, a thank you to, to you, Pat, and thank you to uh, your assistant, Avery, for, uh, for setting that up. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed this 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 special bonus interview episode of the uh, the Hit or Miss podcast. Uh, so what's coming up next, Mike, with regards to the show? Well, we still are on something of a hiatus for the Hit or Miss Star Trek podcast, but do keep an eye on the channel because sometimes you might see things like this popping up or uh, bits and pieces. We will have. Uh, a, an upcoming episode, a, a top 10 episode, which I'm not revealing what it's the top 10 of yet, but it is going to be coming up very soon. Uh, and we will obviously get to eventually later in the year, a full series talking about Klingon episodes, which I've mentioned before. Uh, as far as the Silver Screen podcast goes, we are in the middle of our third series. Uh, we've had a few sort of issues with regards to people that we thought were going to be able to join us and help out. So we've had to make it a fortnightly series instead of weekly releases. Uh, but we are still carrying on with that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we, uh, we're hoping that, uh, we can at least stick to that fortnightly release and we should do, uh, time of watching, I believe our Scream 2022 review or Scream 5 review will be out. We will yeah. be about to release a review of John Wick and we've got upcoming releases for Prometheus and I forget what else, but, uh, we definitely have another top 10 coming up there as well. Bond, Bond movies. We've got a top 10 yes, Bond yes. movies coming up. Top 10 James Bond films. So if you are a 007 fan. You're definitely going to want to stay tuned for that one as well. So, yeah. And if you're a John Wick fan, tune in because neither myself nor Mike has seen it. So and we are joined. We are joined, though, just to fill out a you know a little bit of the context there by super fan Sandra, yeah. Edison, who you'll have heard before, who insisted on us doing the John Wick films and was kind of good. We aren't doing all three, but <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, she's uh, she's the super nerd that's going to talk us through this franchise, and uh, we'll be popping our John Wick cherries. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah all, all that remains then is to say thank you again so much to patricia we honestly could have talked to you for hours it's been such a, a crazy varied career we know you will know her from a thousand places and hopefully you've enjoyed the interview uh stay tuned on both of our channels we'll be back soon but uh in the meantime remember we are starfleet live long and prosper live long and prosper you have been listening to the Hit or Miss Star Trek podcast, hosted by Michael Wilson and DK. Created, produced, and edited by Michael Wilson. Additional material produced by DK. Music by Timeless Journey. More information can be found at soundcloud.com forward slash timeless journey. The Hit or Miss Star Trek podcast is based on an idea by Michael Wilson and Will Templar. Follow the podcast on Instagram at Home Star Trek Podcast or look for the Hit or Miss Star Trek Podcast under Facebook groups. Links to all our social media accounts and more are in this episode's description. This podcast is available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Just look for Silver Screen Hit or Miss Star Trek. This has been a Mike's Podcast production, copyright 2022. Thank you for listening.